and now uh, I introduce uh, Professor Andrew Miles, who is the Senior Vice President and Secretary General of the European Society for Person-Centered Healthcare. Here, the society has uh, uh, split its headquarters from between London and Madrid. Uh, whenever I come to Madrid, whenever I come to the university, the weather always seems to change. <laughs> and uh, and my, my, my colleagues here, um, uh, my colleagues here, uh, talk about this as the English weather. And I always say, I always say to colleagues and to the students at the university. Uh, well, first, firstly, my apologies. And then I quote Oscar Wilde, who then says he didn't really know if the English people produced the English weather, or whether the English weather produced the English people. It, 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 it's a conundrum. I'm not sure anybody has answer, ever answered that question, uh, but uh, my apologies to everybody if I, uh, if I am causally related in any way to, 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 to the weather. Uh, my, my, my purpose, and I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can so we can, ca so we can uh, maintain, uh, uh, catch up on time, uh, is to talk to you about the society, its, its founding principles, which Sir Jonathan has already talked about, and to tell you where we are operationally. And, and where we're going. <clears throat> a little preamble be, before that, though, I think might be, might be uh, useful. Um, it was in the late 1920s that the Harvard professor of medicine, uh, in the late 1920s, 1928, I think, 1929, wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, in an article called The Care of the Patient. Uh, well, he registered his concerns that as medicine was getting more and more scientific, it also seemed to be becoming more and more depersonalized. Um, and that medicine's uh, ability, or growing ability at that time, um, to ameliorate, attenuate, and cure uh, was gaining preferential, and it's extremely important, foundational, of course, but it gaining, it's uh, gaining preferential uh, uh, attention to medicine's uh, inalienable and, and foundational nature uh, to care, comfort, and console. It was as if the, the, the caring and the curing functions of medicine, rather than being held together, were, be, were, were being decoupled, being seen as, as almost alternatives uh, rather than two essential parts of medicine that should always be yoked together uh, in, in, a, in a functional uh, uh, in integration. Um, that was in the, in the 20s, um, late 20s. In the mid 40s uh, and early 50s, in Geneva, uh, a French general practitioner called um, uh, Dr. Paul Tournier noted that things at that point had deteriorated quite beyond the point that Peabody had uh, registered in, in, in the 20s. Um, then, later, many of you will be familiar with this, in the late 80s, um, uh, as a, a GP and sociologist, uh, George Engel, uh, published the biopsychosocial model to try to uh, stem uh, this growing depersonalization and to try to reintroduce into clinical practice th those things which were being taken out, the, 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 the psychosocial aspects, uh, the, the nature of the person that was being stripped out from the science. So as Sir Jonathan has been uh, said, Engel saw that medicine was increasingly seeing the person as, a, as an object or a subject or a complex biological machine, a collection of uh, uh, medicine by uh, organ parts, rather than <coughs> as, a, as, an, as an integral uh, whole, or as this university would see, uh, an embodied soul, but as an integral uh, uh, whole. Uh, the biopsychosocial medicine was, uh, a model was taken up very enthusiastically, I think, by primary care and certainly by nursing but really didn't uh, excite much uh, apart from controversy out outside of that situation. Um, later, the World Health Organization uh, itself uh, noted concern at the uh, depersonalization, even dehumanization of clinical practice, and published several documents where they talked about the need for people-centered uh, healthcare. So there was a move away from the, the, the term public health, which was seen as impersonal, population-based medicine, to the term people-based uh, care, noting that people are individual persons uh, making up a, uh, what, what we would then still see as an epidemiological community, but a community of, 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 uh, of people. In, uh, in our current times, we saw the emergence of two movements, the evidence-based medicine movement, which is very much based on, on the scientific modification of biological trajectories, with, you could say, lip service, perhaps, to other sources of knowledge, such as values and preferences and, uh, and so on. Um, and some of us would argue that that has accelerated the depersonalization. Um, uh, some might disagree. It may, uh, Again, in parallel with this, in the United States in particular, you had the patient-centered care movement, uh, which uh, sought, again, to bring the patient back and, and to, you know, to wave at doctors and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm not just a collection of body parts, I'm a person and I have values and preferences and a social situation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the EBM and the patient-centered care movements have evolved in parallel, but really haven't found it very comfortable to, to talk together. And this has not been, um, not been very uh, helpful. 
We're in a situation now, I think, particularly in the West, but it could be said globally, where medical error uh, rates are at their, high, uh, at their highest ever, medical legal lawsuits are at their highest ever, care home and hospital scandals are at their, uh, uh, people are at their highest, people uh, dying of thirst in beds, people uh, sitting in excrement for days uh, in care homes, people being dragged around uh, by the hair, unwittingly being uh, 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 photographed by CCTV and so on. These things are now becoming so commonplace as, as to be almost normative, and this is extremely uh, worrying uh, because as medicine ha has reached an enormously powerful technical, technically powerful perspective in, in its history, uh, we have the highest levels of frankly documented neglect that we've ever uh, uh, have been uh, unfortunate to, uh, to see. So I think it's clear that, uh, that we, of course we need science, but we need something else as well. So we need science, but we need science plus, science plus humanism. They're not alternatives, uh, uh, on the contrary, and each one cannot be practiced or should not be practiced uh, in, in isolation. So I think the challenge for us is to bring the humanistic aspects back with the science so that we don't have a science, we don't have an evidence-based, uh, scientific evidence-based medicine, but a scientific evidence-informed medicine, where science informs medicine, along with a whole huge range of other knowledge sources of, of importance to the care of the individual patient, values, preferences, narratives, social and work situation, cultural perspectives, emotionality, psychology, spirituality, um, etc., etc., etc. It is impossible uh, uh, to ignore all those functions of the human individual and focus on the scientific modification of, of biological dysfunction and disease trajectory. So science plus, science plus humanism. And I think that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the channel, uh, the, the, the challenge. And within this, we mustn't forget, of course, family and friends and work situations. We often think of the individual who is ill with a disease as the individual who is ill with a disease. But the nature of disease is that it radiates outwards and it affects other people in the family. For example, uh, empirical studies of the spouses of women with breast cancer have shown significant increases in psychosocial morbidity uh, in, and psychological morbidity in these people. So the disease affects the family as well as the individual and the work situation. I mean, that's the nature of it. So person-centered care has to uh, look at all of these things uh, and social and family context uh, uh, too. I think many clinicians are as appalled at what is happening uh, as we are and want to practice more person-centered care, but say, well, well how, am I, how, am I, how do I do it? And how do I do it in, in a resource-constrained uh, 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 in, in environment? And so this was really the reason why uh, Sir Jonathan and I and a, and a core group of other colleagues got together and said, well, there is something we can do to help clinicians address this uh, issue. Um, we can't work in isolation, uh, and as Jonathan said, it's difficult to work in isolation because we face challenges at the institution and so on, and we're often seen as mavericks with, with odd ideas. Uh, we're, we're somehow against science, but of course we're not against science at all. We, we want it with something else. Uh, so we thought we need to create something that is not inward-looking in the UK or inward-looking in Spain, but brings together um, uh, all of the people working in person-centered care in Europe, but, uh, but because we don't have a great deal of experience of this in Europe, to look at to our North American and other colleagues who have been doing this much longer th than ours, and we have many distinguished people here today who are going to give us their thoughts from North America, Canada, uh, well, North America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, as well as those across Europe, who can actually say, look, we've been doing this for many years, this is what you uh, can learn. So very briefly now, this, the background very briefly, but just over, a, let me see, it must, would be probably about 18 months ago, we said, we're going to create a society, and then we're going to announce the fact that we've created a society. And this is what it looked like then. This is what we emailed to everybody. I'm sure lots, some of you went to spam, and I'm sure other people uh, re reacted well, and some other people said, well, you know, is this really necessary? Uh, and you all know who some of those possibly are. So that's how it started. Um, so, the society has a structure, it has a president who's already uh, addressed us, uh, a, se a senior vice president to support the president, myself, uh, and then we said, okay, we need to divide Europe up in some way, so we looked at the UN uh, division of Europe, which says, okay, Eastern, Northern, Southern, and Western Europe, and here you can, uh, here you can see uh, the appointed uh, vice presidents for those UN demarcated areas of, uh, of uh, Europe. The society has various grades of membership. You can see them here, distinguished fellow, fellow, professional member, very important patient member, because it would be uh, absurd of us to have a European Society for Person-Centered Medicine uh, and not to dialogue and have the membership of patients themselves. Uh, industry, inescapable, uh, as, as uh, uh, supporters of our work uh, and, uh, and so on, and, and associates and, in fact, student uh, members uh, as well. The society has, uh, uh, in fact, at the time of writing, um, uh, 83 special interest groups. 
And we put these together so, uh, as, uh, in, in, as sort of hothouses so people can get together and say, okay, I'm interested in this specific component of person-centered medicine because person-centered medicine has a wide variety of uh, individual components that have to be brought together to enable an effective practice. So we have 83 special interest groups. Uh, here you, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, the, the common cancers, uh, some of the, the chronic illnesses, and what we're talking about here uh, are, the, are the principal diagnoses. Uh, of course, many of these will be comorbid, but these are the principal uh, diagnoses that we've talked about here. You can see further examples of, uh, of the chronic illnesses. Uh, other, others, um, cultural competence, complexity theory, and we have Dr. Kamala Martin here, child and family-centered care, Linda Shields, who will be uh, videoing into us, uh, bioethics, et cetera, et cetera, burnout syndrome, which uh, uh, Professor Stoyanov uh, uh, we'll be talking about uh, drug and alcohol addiction, epistemology and ontology, which Professor Lim Getz will be talking about. Uh, of course, we need to look at the relationship of evidence-based medicine and, and person-centered care. Health economics, inescapable. And it's interesting, as Sir Jonathan said, that the, uh, the uh, accumulating empirical economic base now is showing that person-centered approaches can actually reduce costs, which is counterintuitive to many doctors. Uh, and later in this conference, I think tomorrow, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing how it, how it actually does that and how empirical studies are beginning to show that. Implementation issues, medical humanities, um, mind-body medicine. It's increasingly recognized uh, that there is such a thing as a link between the mind and the body. Uh, the psychoneuroimmunological axis, uh, empirical studies are showing that what goes on up here definitively affects many physiological functions, even down to the level of lymphocyte function. And these are empirical, hard scientific studies. So mind-body medicine. Uh, nothing weird about that in, 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 in one sense. Um, uh, other uh, patient advocacy, education and empowerment. Uh, here we go. Uh, Person-centered clinical guidelines. The guidelines we have at the moment tend to be very technically and biomedically focused. How can we, cha how can we add into that? How can we add the plus into that? Uh, so we actually add in person-centered um, guidance alongside the biomedical and technological prescriptions. So we move from organ systems to person. Uh, that group will be looking at those issues. Person-centered health records. Uh, if we're going to practice person-centered care, we need to be collecting more different types of information in addition to the core biomedical information that we typically collect. Postgraduate and undergraduate training, psychosexual and psychosocial care, um, shared decision making. Uh, one of the big, one of the big uh, issues now, etc., etc., etc. A Learned Society needs a learned journal, and uh, we launched uh, uh, two years ago the European Journal for Person-Centered Healthcare, and we've just committed to press volume two, issue two of the journal, uh, and we're submitting a, an application to PubMed in December of this year. Uh, we already know officially from them that we've fulfilled every criterion so we, uh, that, they, that they lay down, so we're uh, very confident that we will get indexing uh, very extremely soon in, in the beginning of the new year. Uh, you see the journal there, and, and here was the, the last edition last issue. Uh, at the moment we have a, 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 what I would call an Oxford textbook uh, style uh, um, textbook of uh, um, person-centered healthcare. It's a 55 chapter textbook uh, and that's currently under construction uh, and that's, that's what the cover looks like. Uh, the content will we hope be a, a little more uh, interesting um, and that should be published in just a little under um, uh, a year's time, probably in about 10 months time since we're chasing the remaining 20 of the 55 chapters at the time of writing, that time of speaking, Rob. Um, talking about the application of person-centered principles to biomedical and um, technological guidelines, one of our first, um, one of our first uh, d um, illness-specific uh, uh, conferences and, and publications to be held here at UFV uh, will be on the person-centered care of, of people living with HIV AIDS. And th this is going to be, I think, fascinating because, you know, at the moment, uh, when people are sorted, um, they get one pill a day uh, and they see their consultant once every six months. So 15 minutes every six months, a bit of toxicology to make certain that uh, the, 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 the drugs aren't causing more, more harm uh, than, than, than uh, a benefit, and away they go with six months of, of pills. Uh, within that six months, people have uh, uh, existential issues, depression, anxiety, worries, uh, problems with the relational functioning. Uh, they're often um, in and out of work. Um, they have uh, various addictions uh, and so on. There's a huge amount of things going on in these people's lives that are affecting them dramatically that are just not looked at or cannot be looked at with a 15-minute toxicology test every six months and one pill a day. Uh, you know, this is one of the most dramatic examples of, of, of where there's a, 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 an extraordinary deficit in, in, in care. 
So we've talked to the European uh, Aid Society, who publish uh, uh, approved European guidelines uh, on the management of HIV, and they are very biomedically and technologically focused. Uh, um, uh, so we've said, okay, we don't want to take anything out of your guidelines. We, we, we can't do that. We, you know, we don't have the competence to do that. You, you decided it. But what we'd like to do, if you'd like, your guidelines are written in black, what we want to do is to write in red and superimpose in red ink, if you like, person-centered uh, uh, suggestions and advice on top of the biomedical and technological prescriptions. So we want to take nothing out, but we want to add in. So in a sense, we want, we want the science of HIV plus the humanism that should be part of it, taking, taking, taking you back to what I, what I said uh, earlier on. And in order to do this, um, uh, we, need, we need something practical. The textbook I just showed you will be 50, you know, is an academic textbook, 55 chapters, God knows how many words, uh, a good academic text for teaching. But, but this is, a, this is a, a pocket handbook. So, so for the juniors and others uh, who, are, who are managing these, and nurses and others who are managing these conditions, they can sort of look in and say, well, what should I be doing? Ah, it's been two years since there's been a psychosexual, uh, psycho, uh, sexual or psychosocial assessment of this patient. That should probably be done every year. At least this book says it should be. Oh, we'll do one. Uh, depression and anxiety. Well, no, we haven't screened for that. Let's ask the patient about this, etc., etc., etc. So by adding in these these guidelines and not taking anything out, the handbooks will hopefully uh, help our, our, our colleagues in the field uh, to uh, to increase the person centered increase the person centeredness of their uh, clinical practice. Uh, we have the, um, the the generic journal uh, of the society, the official journal of the society, uh, but in. Uh, January of 2015, we're launching a small series of illness-specific journals, uh, which, which will look at these principles in the context of the specific illness. And uh, going on from the handbook I've, I've just shown you, uh, the first uh, uh, issue of the journal in uh, January 2015 will be the European Journal of Person-Centered HIV. Uh, well, actually, we've decided to call it HIV care, because if we, if we say healthcare, we ignore the social dimension, uh, and, that's, you know, and, 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 and therefore there's a bit of integration there that will be missing. Uh, so we, it actually will be the, the European Journal for person Centered HIV Care uh, in January 2015. We'll, we'll go on with another one in diabetes and another one in the care of the frail elderly uh, after that. Uh, the society, as I mentioned, has 83. It had 82 um, uh, special interest groups until three weeks ago uh, when I talked to Professor Ellis, who will be talking to us in due course, uh, and he said, well, actually, the person Centered Care of Learning Difficulties uh, is, isn't within your structure, why not? And I said, well, I can't answer the question, really. We already have so many. And he said, well, I'd like to chair one of those. And I said, uh, given his uh, 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 dominance in the field, um, fine, so we now have 83 special interest groups. I'll, I'll go th very quickly through some of them. You can see uh, who's been appointed as chairman of these groups here. Several of these SIG chairmen are here uh, with us now, will be here with us tomorrow. Um, and so, and of these, we've now, of the 83 groups, uh, since January of this year, when the society was fully operational, uh, we've appointed to 30 of the 83 special interest groups. And the role of these chairmen is to uh, recruit people in their field uh, to membership of the group uh, to push the person-centered de uh, development of care uh, 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 forward. We, the society invites corporate members, and we were very pleased that the Italian Society of Medicine and a person became a corporate member of the society recently and we have some other people who we're talking to will also become corporate members of the society. The Italian society, and like many other societies, were rather sort of national. They were, they were looking in rather than out across Europe. And I think uh, the, uh, the, the society felt that it was being a little parochial uh, and uh, has welcomed membership of the society in order to join with other colleagues and, and, and say, what's the situation in Spain then? What's the situation in um, Bulgaria then? What's the situation in Scandinavia then? And, and you know, we'll be enabling that as well. Uh, I've already mentioned the, uh, the forthcoming uh, conference on person centered HIV AIDS care. Um, uh, we have a conference here at the university on person centered undergraduate clinical education. H how do we increase the person centeredness of, uh, of, how do we increase the humanistic nature of our graduates through, hopefully, through selection at the beginning of the, uh, of the um, uh, process uh, as well as uh, during the teaching? And we're in the first annual conference today, and the second annual conference of the, of the Society will take place on 18th and 19th of June of next year, and the special theme of that conference will be the exploring the precise relationship of evidence-based medicine, person-centered care, and, and the sort of North American version of patient-centered uh, uh, care. So we'll, we'll be looking specifically at that to, to clarify it. Uh, the Society is accumulating money, uh, not least from the delicate receipts that many of you have paid, 
uh, to be able to uh, give uh, part-time high degree sponsorships so that doctors and nurses working in practice uh, can study part-time and can answer a, a, an empirical uh, or a qualitative type uh, question of relevance to, to, to their, their, their practice and then get a master's degree uh, uh, or a PhD by part-time study. So we're accumulating the funds to be able to do that uh, and we hope to announce the first such sponsorship uh, by December of this uh, year. Um, we need to train, uh, we talk, you know, medical students fine and, and, and nursing students fine, but there are lots and lots and lots of people in practice uh, who have, uh, have asked, well, you know, is there any training available for us? Uh, and we said, okay, um, we're going to put together, and Salman Rav and I have talked about this, because one of them I think will be at Imperial, and, and, and one in Rome, and one in Madrid, and, and so on. We're putting together a series of seven-day intensive uh, training courses in person-centered uh, healthcare. Now, these take uh, two forms. Uh, the first one is an intensive seven-day residential course for the education of clinicians who really don't know a lot about person-centered care, but want to, to, to learn more. So it's a sort of basic, uh, basic introduction, introduction to person-centered care. What is it? How do you do it? Uh, and, and so on. And then there will be another, uh, a, a sort of teach the teachers uh, uh, course, uh, for people who already know a lot about person-centered care, but want to become teachers and mentors uh, in, in practice. And so that will be an advanced uh, seven-day residential course. And we're actually working uh, on, on those at the, at the uh, moment. So, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is where, that is the background of the society and where the society uh, is at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, please uh, become more and more involved. If you're not already not a member, please join, because we have an uphill struggle and we really can't do it without you. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, <coughs> Andrew, very much for this introduction to the Society and his huge amount of activities and projects. So I suggest for the next speakers that uh, we the table go down yeah. to see the presentations, and I'll be uh, I will invite uh, Professor Salman Rawaf to to join the the table. Professor Rawaf is director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Public Health Education and Training uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College London, and is a well-known speaker about the topic he's going to to introduce here: health systems and non-communicable disease. Uh, chronic disease, gen generally known as chronic disease. So, and then after Professor Salman, I will invite uh, the next speaker, and then we will join the table for questions and comments. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair, for the kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. While waiting for my slide, uh, it's truly a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful for the kind invitation from Andrew. Andrew is a colleague uh, which uh, most probably we trained together almost <laughs> some years back in medicine and public health. But um, having said that, I mean, the movement of uh, uh, PCM, person-centered medicine, as, as a concept, sorry. Uh, so, <coughs> Andrew was with me when, with colleagues from Northern America, we initiated the concept about seven, eight years ago. The term was absolutely unknown at that time. And I'll tell you why it was the rationale from at least my perspectives. As you know, there are 300, uh, let me get it correct. There are 2,735 universities in the world, medical schools, with medical schools, you know. In today's world, and you have to believe this, we believe there is about 150, maybe less universities, which is graduating doctors to the level which we are expecting them. And of course, we don't expect doctors today in the 21st century leaving the medical school with the competencies required to practice medicine. You know, they need to go in a full training program. I moved from policy making for 26 years as executive director in the NHS to being educationalist at Imperial College. And uh, one of my job I do visiting 
medical school and assessing the capability of the medical schools. And we are in an era, there is a dream, you know, and I think uh, uh, Sir Jonathan and Andrew alluded to it. Uh, by the way, we read the same article on the plane, you know. <laughs> uh, alluded, alluded to it, uh, which is giving more time to our patient. This is, will never happen. This is a mirage, you know. The world is have a shortage of about 4.6 million doctors and nurses. And to expect any health systems, I mean, my health system, which is, as you know, in the United Kingdom, I'm, I'm, I'm part of that for many, many years at high level, you know, under tremendous pressure, you know, because we cannot meet demand. Uh, and I'll show you some of the challenges uh, we are facing. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to show all the slides, you know, because it's, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm talking to, to top experts from around the world, but I'm just sharing some of the <coughs> primary data on how can we address the issues in the question. I mean, the title of this presentation could be anything. Could be NCD, could be any disease or group of diseases or patient care, you know. But I chose in here NCD because the importance of NCD in shaping our thinking, whether we are educationalists as med at medical school or responsible for training of doctors, nursing, and other health professionals. And in most importantly, I will touch on this tomorrow, in, in how to shape our health system in the future. So it is a driver among many other drivers. In today's world, as you see from the slide, we are facing many challenges, you know. And I must say, majority of us are not up to meet these challenges, you know. Uh, especially the advances in medicine and technology, you know. Uh, 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 to be very honest with you, if you don't have a huge investment, you cannot run some of the services today. You cannot run even medical school if you are not in the bracket of a huge investment. And things is moving to nursing as well soon, you know. And I think we are underestimating the power of information. Uh, the power of information is vastly underestimated by especially health professionals. I mean, there is an ostrich attitude to it. And also we've seen around the world the role of government is shifting, shifting rapidly over the time in terms of who is responsible for care, who, how should we deliver care. Uh, I don't want to go into the argument, uh, but that link to the way social value is also shifting. And, and, and summarizing the huge lit literature about actually challenges to health and health care around the world, let us move quickly. You will see that chronic diseases is on the top. We call it in the United Kingdom actually long-term conditions. So the, the, the term, as you see in, in subsequent slide, sometimes we use long-term conditions, sometimes use chronic diseases. But of course, WHO quite rightly using the NCD, non-communicable diseases. So we have this rising concern about NCDs. And this is simply because of the way we are living and the way we are enjoying or not enjoying our life. It depends on how you see it, you know. It's amazing. Uh, I, I've seen a uh, couple of patients recently, uh, and, I, and I couldn't really handle the situation, and to be honest with you, how obese they are. And, and, I, I, and I didn't know how to communicate to a beautiful lady, 36 years old, you know, over 22 stones, you know. I don't, how do you translate stone into kilos? I don't know. <laughs> you know, and I said to her simply, why are, you, why are you carrying another person with you all the time? You know, it's truly is equivalent to someone carrying another person with him or with her all the time. So you see all these challenges, which is almost facing every health system around the world today, you know? And for policymakers and even educationalists at, at, at universities, you know, these challenges are, are something which we are not researched very well, you know? 
And I'm very, very pleased to say that the European Union and indeed the British government, one of them, are investing in these areas a huge amount of resources. I mean, the one related to the PCC is very much the, related to the high expectation and the increasing demand on our services, you know. And almost all health systems around the world, you know, is operating beyond its means. I'm not aware of any health system having supply ex exceeding demands. I'm not aware of any health system can live with its budget, you know. I mean, we know that. These are facts well documented, well documented by WHO as well. So, so uh, uh, let, me, let me look whether we are prepared, you know, to deal with this tsunami of uh, burden of diseases which are affecting literally every uh, population, whether it is in Western society or indeed in uh, actually low-income countries, you know. I, as I said, there is no difference between this. I think uh, we know from experience that if you put figures uh, about the global burden or related to certain conditions, you know, people may not understand it. When you say, uh, uh, you know, 4% uh, or 8% or 22% of the adult population with diabetes, figure doesn't mean much. But when you equate it to uh, something dramatic like uh, equivalent to 10 jumbo jet airplane crashed in a city or something like that, or translated into monetary things, which is money, because money talks. And on the table in front, you are showing that magnitude. You are talking about a huge amount of uh, uh, economic loss in terms of productivity, in terms of the cost of treatment, in terms of the time people actually spending to seek treatment, you know is really huge. And remember, there are very, very few countries in the world in relation to about 194 countries, which is part of the UN, you know, and members of WHO. Very few countries where citizens can seek care without digging in their own pockets, you know. The vast majority, if you go to Namibia, if you go to some, some part of the world, a single dose of insulin may be equivalent to a whole week wage. A whole week salary is equivalent for a single dose of insulin. So remember that, you know. And again, if you look at that, the uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, in, I just wanted to compare the low income countries with the actually upper income countries. It's quite similar, but, but you will see that we're talking about a huge amount of uh, money we are spending. Again, this is projected for the 2030, uh, uh, currently from uh, uh, 34 million deaths associated with NCD, it will jump to over 50, 55 million by the year 2030, which is not far away, by the way. And uh, the global uh, burden, i.e. in terms of expenditure, 3 billion. Remember also that the entire globe spend less than seven billion, sorry, seven trillion on health. The entire world spend seven trillion on less than seven trillion on health. Two point five trillion of that between two point two to two point five trillion in the United States alone. You know? You're talking about 80% of the expenditure happening in the top 20 countries around the world, from United States, Europe, of course, included, and Japan. The rest of the world is spending about 1.2 trillion. So again, the distribution of, of, of wealth around the world in terms of expenditure on health services is uneven. A lot of people around the world are suffering, you know. I, I, I maybe exaggerated uh, the number of slides in reflecting the monitoring impact, but this is really linked to diseases, et cetera, you know. So you see cancer on the top, and uh, HIV is not as high as cancer and coronary heart diseases, et cetera. We're still having these four important conditions as the main 
actually burden of disease around the world and in society. And the contributing factors are very well known. And uh, some of these are visible to us with symptomatology, others are not. I mean, majority, half of us here in this room may have high blood pressure, but we are not aware of it, you know, uh, or sometimes ignore it. I mean, the way we smoke, the high level of uh, cholesterol, etc. you know. So these, these conditions affecting us, you know, uh, uh, and these are trigger. Uh, the cause of coronary heart diseases, the cause of cancer, etc. These are common among the main four NCDs, the well-known four NCDs of uh, cardiovascular cancer, diabetes, and respiratory diseases, mainly COPD. And I'm sure you've seen this uh, from uh, 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 global uh, uh, burden of disease picture which is published by this, uh, our colleagues in Seattle uh, in the BMJ and recently they looked at each region in separate way uh, uh, it's uh, uh, there the reference uh, on the slide which I leave it with you you can look at it but again what is what is what we have today projected to be the same within the next 10 years you know with the exception of some countries, mainly third world countries, they have road traffic accident, will be jumped at the top of the list of the burden of diseases, you know. Again, if you look, I'm sorry, this is maybe iPad, uh, Apple does, does not fit with HP, <laughs> and this figure the things. Um, and again, this is, this is one region which I'm trying to show. That, that diabetes, for example, is jumping at the top in some countries in, in, within the Eastern Mediterranean region, which is not far away from you on the other side of the coast. You know, diabetes is maybe about 25% of the adult population, one in four, and mainly related to obesity. You know? And I'm sure this is a creeping to Spain because you have quite similar culture. You know? And the year the lost here is, is, is uh, 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 quite obvious, related to these, you know, uh, the same condition, we see it more and more, uh, etc. Again, as I said, I'm not going to indulge in that. I will leave it to you because I just want to find some sort of solution. Cardiovascular diseases, this is the map around the world. We can map any condition and show you the color, you know, I mean how it is in, in the areas around the old Soviet Union, indeed, and uh, China, the Middle East, and Africa. Look at the red, uh, how it's distributed, you know. The problem is, we know what is the burden of disease. The problem is the failure of educationalists and policymakers in addressing it. That's the problem, you know. I mean, the data here I'm presenting is absolutely useless if not absorbed by policymakers. If they don't modernize and change their system, you know, it becomes meaningless. And I'll show you how we manage to reduce coronary heart disease or the burden of coronary heart diseases. For example, in the United Kingdom, by 50%. In the area which I manage was leading health in that area, we managed to reduce it in one's worth to seven, by 70%, you know? And I'll show you how, you know? It's about changing the system. You cannot talk about it, talk about it every day. This is like meaningless, because it's, everybody knows about it. The problem is, I'm a dean of medical school and I don't do anything about it, then I'm not doing my job, you know? Or I am at a policy, or a professor of public health or professor of medicine, just sit down receiving patient. I'm nothing but idiot, pathetically idiot, because I have to do something. This lower stream approach is cowardly approach and cannot be accepted by our population today. They expect more. And if you are talking about person-centered healthcare, that is the starting point, not about really giving time to patient. It's about changing the policies at the top, you know. But because we are actually where, what, what we are, just doing the job which we are doing, indulging in, in routine, and love comfort zones, you know, 
we cannot change anything. So we can talk for the rest of our life about person-centered medicine and person-centered healthcare. Nothing is going to happen, you know. And let me give you some solution. We have clear strategy from WHO, led by Professor Alwan when we has Assistant Director General. We have the summit in 2011 by the head of state in New York, you know, where every head of state, including uh, the president of, uh, this was, you don't have president, of course, you have king. The, the uh, prime minister of Spain was there, you know. All of us were there at that time and all signed the declaration on NCD. And we have the best by defined by WHO is well documented. I don't want to talk about it, you know. But I think what we need, it need integrated approaches through one system. I mean, you see most of the systems in the world, patient suffering, they don't know where to go. The system which, which, which is starting with the primary care is the best system. At least I know I have a doctor who can understand me, you know. I mean, I, I, I tell you from personal experience, I, I got a pain just here, I mean, a few months ago. And I called my GP, he's one of my students, he's very kind, he gave me personal center medicine. He came to my house, have supper with me, examined me, said I'll do all the investigation. And they done all the investigation, the book document, they couldn't find anything, you know? But it, 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 the, the issue is, I went to my GP. The issue is, if I went to, trust me, to a hospital, I would finish with two unnecessarily, three unnecessarily procedures. The pain disappeared within a week. I, I haven't gi given a pill, you know? Because there is nothing in the pathology, there is nothing in the scan, there is nothing in the ultrasound, you know? But trust me, if I went directly to a hospital colleague, I will finish with TORP, I finish with an endoscope, I will finish with variety of things I, I would not need, you know? Because pain does happen, you know? And we know that, it's well documented as well, you know? I collect these in the slides, I normally talk only about this slide for one hour, you know? But, but I think in the front of you here, the three circle is about how to integrate, you know, population-wide targeted public health intervention. It's the marriage between public health, primary care, and uh, hospital medicine. And this is what the, what the medical student don't understand. This is where we poor with our medical student and nursing student, you know? Because what we teach them to focus on the disease, not the person, you know? Shifting the curriculum from the focus from disease to the patient it's a radical change. And I tell you, there are very, very few universities managed to do it. Very few. I mean, if you come to Imperial College, the entire focus is on the person, not the disease. You know? So you have to shape the curriculum. And shaping the curriculum is very difficult. In the health services, when you focus on the first person, move away from the disease, you have to change the system. And changing the system is not easy. You know? you have a lot of work. And I'll show you some of these issues. When you change the system toward the person, you will find majority of the intervention in our system up to 90% is happen outside hospital. You know, in community setting, at home, and in the primary care. And we're not talking about primary care people just graduated from medical school and went to sitting in a clinic, you know, like an outpatient clinic. No, it's about people who are trained in family medicine. And only a very small fraction of people are referred to hospital. And this is how it should be. And this is what we have the problem in, in our system. You find very large number of people because of this, quite rightly, big movement within Europe. You know, we have about, about one million people who, from Spain living in the United Kingdom, by the way, and they are most welcome, you know? All of them, all the European are most welcome. This is how Europe should be. But yet, because the people who come from Bulgaria, Poland, etc., they don't understand the concept of primary care, 
they, they actually overload our accident and emergency department because, because the concept to them, when I'm ill, I go to the hospital. There is nothing which is when I'm ill, I go to one who pay attention to me, a personal attention, which is my doctor. That concept does not exist. Uh, and in my area, I have to modify actually the accident and emergency department. I set up primary care clinic with a GP 24 hour where they registered there, you know, because the majority of them don't, don't register. And you see, this is, this is addressing the whole concept of comprehensive universal coverage. I know we have this debate with WHO about essential uh, universal health coverage. I don't believe in it, and the Lancet Commission is moving now uh, into progressive universal health coverage, uh, very, very admirable concept to move toward comprehensive one. But the way we have to do it, let me get all the arrows for you, all right? So make it complicated, you know? The way we have to do it, I mean, whether it is a specific measure within public health or a specific measure for primary care, as, as you see in these arrows, feeding the policy and the decision-making process, at the heart of it, and every single process, is how to engage the population. And that engagement is really the most difficult one, you know? I mean, if you take who is running the hospital, who is running primary care, who is involved in policy making and decision making, who is involved in setting the curriculum, how many lay people, Dean, you have on your curriculum committee? How many? Lay people. They are not doctors, not nurses. They are from outside the public. Uh, great. If you have 10 people from our, this is great. And this is the question we have to ask. Because if I'm running Marx and Spencer, you know, and you will see how much they consult. If I'm running a shop or anything like that, you know, how much I consult the people who are receiving the services, the product. And this is a very important concept for PCM. You know. So other people succeed by integrate, and I'm, I'll finish by giving you just some small example how, pe how other people manage to succeed. Integrating these elements of public health, primary care, and hospital care. I mean, this is really essential, you know. This is how we manage to reduce coronary heart diseases, by using the technology effectively. If I got heart attack, you know, because I'm aware now I'm educated as a person, I know what are the signs and symptoms of heart attack. I mean, everybody knows, recognize it, but it could be early or stroke, you know. I'll dial 999, you know. The ambulance will be, part of the system will be with me within 12 minutes, you know, because it is designed like this. The ambulance now equipped with all the technology in the world needed for that steps, you know, and indeed the people who are trained to a level that they can give, you know, uh, antiembolytic, etc., treatment to the patient at the ambulance, in the ambulance itself. Immediately all the, the investigation, okay, all the biochemical investigation, etc., blood tests, etc., done, and the ECG done in the ambulance, sent electronically to the hospital, all right? While the way, in the way, patient is transferred in the ambulance, more detail is given to the hospital, the hospital decide immediately what to do to the patient. In most of the cases, the patient will finish in the theater with a stent or ballooning, having a cup of tea uh, three hours later, leaving the hospital that night can have love and uh, beautiful dinner, uh, uh, whatever, beautiful bottle of wine. And that how it reduce coronary heart disease. Changing the system, the point which I started. It is about system and changing the system. But you see, part of the system, the GP is there, the patient is involved. Patient is part of that. And the patient is really involved because the system needs to prepare the public for event like this. 
through education. This is where they are engaged. We are reaching them all the time, you know. And you have to enforce a lot of things, you know. The cigarette smoking now in Britain is more or less impossible to smoke, even in your car, you know, and if you have a passenger, etc., which is beautiful. Uh, I miss it when I go to other countries, which I, I uh, some, some people, they call me the homeless professors because I spend more time in hotel than in, in, in my wife's bed, you know. Uh, so we managed to decrease the prevalence substantially, you know. And this is the drop in coronary heart diseases. Everywhere in the world, except some of the European countries, is going up. Everywhere in the world is exactly in the opposite direction than this, which is beautiful. We, this is what we want to see. This is the message, Andrew, for PCM. This is the real message. It's about moving the whole population, rather only one person, into something which, is, which are more positive. But at the same time, we are fighting the enemies of public health. We have so many enemies of public health, which is really is difficult for policymakers to leave them alone. And they don't leave us alone. I'm sorry about this uh, size of the things. You know, the commercial greed we've seen, the power of the lobbying, you know. You have all these things, the, mis the misuse of medicine. I'll talk about this tomorrow. Actually, I'll touch on it, and how much affecting the public health agenda <coughs> in negative way, misusing scarce resources at every level. And we know we have the system, system failure, the service fragmentation, the weak public services in some countries, the unregulated the private sector, uh, and the concept which is actually, I'm very glad Obama reforms or called now Obama healthcare, you know, is moving against that element of profit before health. And poor leadership, of course, at every stage, I, I mentioned that. And I think really to succeed, I'm just putting at the end this for you to think about, you know. We have to take this in a systematic way. This is not about patchy approach, because I'm good in this, I'll do it. You know, we have to do it collectively. This is where, you know, you have that collective responsibility. This is not about uh, uh, only individual things. But to me, the last two is the building leadership for the future. People who can make a difference, who can change. Without a leadership, the system will not progress. And focusing on person-centered medicine, person-centered healthcare, you have to think about the person in total. This is remind me of what we are doing every day. This is precisely what we do, you know? We focus on the disease, not the person. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Salman. Uh, now I will invite uh, Professor Stephen Buto for the next presentation. <laughs> professor Buto is Associate Professor of the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, and Chairman for B Person Center Health Research. Okay. Right, good morning everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my presentation is Person-Centered Care what it is and what it isn't. And I'm from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Well, I've been travelling about 25 hours and I'm feeling really tired, but I'm going to do my very best to summon every ounce of energy that I can muster to make my presentation both illuminating and interesting. Um, so forgive me if I feel a little bit, if, if I look a little bit tired, but uh, I'm going to do my best for you. My, my Four aims are to define patient-centred care, uh, to suggest some concerns about patient-centred care, to suggest how person-centred care addresses these concerns, and to summarise differences between patient-centred and person-centred care. Now, I would normally just speak from my mind and from my heart, but because I have travelled such a huge distance for 20 minutes, although I've got two more presentations, I actually scripted my talk and I'm going to read most of it 
Um, so I hope you'll forgive me and I'll read it slowly because I know the risk when you read is that you can read much too quickly. Do I? Oh, sorry. I have to put it up here. Why don't you just switch it on? I'll switch it on. You can't hear me. How do I do this? Here. Oh, hear me now? Yes. Crawl. <laughs> right. So at the risk of being simplistic, I'm going to draw on Don Berwick's uh, triumvirate of ideas, trilogy of ideas. Put simply, patient-centered care, patient, not person-centered. I'm going to make a clear distinction between patient-centered and person-centered. Patient-centered care has three key principles. The first one is what is called the principle of primacy of patient welfare. So put simply, the needs of the patient come first. And that is sacrosanct in medical professionalism. If you look at the Charter of Medical Professionalism, you'll see that right up there. Number two, as Don says nothing about me without me, he really means the patient is fully involved as an active participant in their own health care. And thirdly, every patient is the only patient, highly individualised care. One of the problems with EBM, of course, how do you translate? How do you move from population averages to the person, the individual person in front of you? Now, I want to elaborate on the first principle. The first principle, remember, was the principle of primacy of patient welfare, putting the patient's interests first. I love Edvard Munch, uh, sorry, Edvard Munch. He's, he's a wonderful uh, artist from Norway, of course. And this is a lithograph called Jealousy. And I don't want to talk about jealousy. I, when I saw this, I saw something quite different. What I saw was a man looking from the dark. He's in the dark, and for me, he is the doctor, all right? So he's the clinician in the dark. And in the light, you can see two patients. So the clinician in the dark, the patients in the light. The clinician can see the patients there in the light. He can't see himself. He's in the dark. Likewise, the patients can see themselves, but they can't see the clinician because he's in the dark. So the focus is on the patient. Clinician caring for the patient, patients caring for themselves, but in the shade, in the dark, the clinician cannot see himself or self-care. And of course, there's no space there, there's no light there for patients to care for their clinician. So there are the patients. Now, I've got six concerns about patient-centered care. The first concern relates to the problematic nature of the very word patient. The word patient, if you look at its etymology, at its root, comes from the Latin word, and I never studied Latin at school or at university, but I'm, it comes from the word, and forgive me if I mispronounce it, patiens. The patient cannot lose the shadow of its Latin root, and that root connotes suffering and dependency, the dependency of one who is acted upon in patiently receiving health care. And this shadow for me over the word patient contradicts the language, contradicts the ethos of active participation by patients as partners in patient-centered care. Secondly, patient-centered care makes implicit rather than explicit the personhood of patients and other participants in healthcare. And this weakens the ability to see, understand, and respect the person behind the social role of being a patient or and other roles. As a consequence, Perhaps patient-centered care has failed to present, to prevent the depersonalization of patients and clinicians. 
Such depersonalization is evident, for example, in deindividuating clinical practices and an erosion of clinical empathy and of clinician and patient trust and autonomy in healthcare. And uh, he, here is a slide that shows how public confidence and trust in the leadership in domains, including medicine, has collapsed over at least the last 40 years to an all-time low, uh, at least in the United States. Another Lynch, uh, sorry, um, another uh, lithograph here from Ed, uh, Edvard Munch. Thirdly, patient-centred care understates the moral need of many patients as people to reciprocate care, to return care to their clinician within the limits of their capabilities to return to reciprocate care to those with whom their lives are intertwined in and beyond healthcare. Related to this concern is unease that patient-centred care has in practice de-emphasised and indeed has been morally blind and insensitive to the welfare and other moral interests of clinicians. My fifth concern is that patient-centred care has understated the need for clinical practice to be evidence-informed and to hold evidence-based medicine satisfactorily to account. And lastly, patient-centred care has tended perhaps to focus on interactions within visit-based and episode-oriented care rather than longitudinal care based on accumulated relational knowledge. That's uh, Barbara Starfield's uh, perspective. Uh, primary care guru who recently passed away. Now, to address such concerns, person-centred care puts people at the centre of health care. It humanises this relational space as one delimiting a scientific practice in which all people, not just patients, all people, according to their capabilities, can care for each other and themselves as moral equals. I, I don't expect you all to agree with everything I say, but... I can tell you that I've thought deeply about these issues and this is how I feel and if I can at least stimulate thinking and debate it would be wonderful. For me, person-centred care fosters four key principles that together are revolutionary. I've got a colleague, a wonderful colleague in North Carolina who disagrees with me. He thinks person-centred care is evolutionary. I think it's revolutionary and I've got four bombs so these principles or bombs are bioethical personalism, overt caring, moral equality, bridging, and scientific humanism. And I'll speak briefly to each one in turn. So bioethical personalism, personalism, what do I mean by that? I mean that it focuses on the ethical primacy of the person. It values personhood as a common, shared and inclusive quality that goes beyond individualism. The quality of personhood has inherent dignity that from virtue ethics derives from the nobility of what we are, ontologically what we are and who we become, rather than merely what we do or can do as emphasised by capabilities theory. Meanwhile, personalism reduces and bridges boundary differences between patients and clinicians. We are all people. And family and friends, as, as Andrew said before. It unifies patients and clinicians who as moral equals share moral interests such as treatment with respect. At the same time, it helps to create common moral, sorry, common ground between personal, healthcare, 
and people-centred public health care. But what is a person? I should mention here that a person is typically defined either existentially as all human beings, which is my personal preference, or actually more often in philosophy, although Michael will no doubt correct me if I'm mistaken, or relationally as anyone whose capabilities and value entitle them to moral consideration. And people debate about what those different capabilities are. Interestingly, this distinction seems to dissolve if capabilities are constructed as basic, inherent, and latent. I've got a little clip here which I hope works. I've uh, sent across the um, video file, but we'll find out. Um, I'm just not sure that I'm pushing the, pushing the return key because it's in Spanish and I don't know which one is the return key. Is there a return key? I've, I, basically, I should be able to click on it and it should play. Uh, if, uh, by way of introduction, this is a very, very tiny, a short clip. I have a history for him which is richer than any history I'd had before. And right at the heart of that history is a human being. And I don't think he had been a human being for me before. Um, the next one is overt caring. So for me, person-centered care revitalizes overt caring. Thank you. Patient-centered care likewise promotes an ethic of care. However, it does so in relation to a professional duty of care. In contrast, perhaps person-centered care highlights the obligation on people, again within the limits of their capabilities, to cultivate and express virtues that include respect for others and themselves, and what I like to call joyful caring, joyful caring, not because I have to, but because it's a wonderful thing to do, for caring for other people and themselves. By joyful caring, I mean caring that constructs health, but also illness as a stimulus for building and showing good character. Can I play a tiny clip now, which is, um, this is Patch Adams, the real Patch Adams, not, uh, yes, and uh, worth watching, worth watching. So this is just again a, a edited clip. And it mostly doesn't sit as pain because that takes your energy. It is stimulus. Feel the pain, it's horrible. Don't hold the pain. Go, it is painful, let's get to work. Let's get to work joyfully to change it. And I just couldn't resist the temptation to put in this quote, which I really like from Teddy Roosevelt. You know, I work in a university and knowledge is, you know, everything. But no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I think it's a lovely quote, so to include that. Whoops. We also respect patients by recognising that they can and typically want to reciprocate overt caring to others, including clinicians, such as by expressing gratitude or understanding when my GP is late and I've been waiting half an hour and she tells me it's because somebody else has, had, has a more acute need than I do and I'm perfectly, well, I try to be understanding and that's just a way of reciprocating and showing respect. Um, the nature of such reciprocation will of course vary situationally. However, it may reduce work-related stress and burnout among clinicians when their patients show that they care about their clinician. It responds to the need of clinicians to construct meaning from their work and feel valued and feel well enough to offer the best care possible. 
Next, I want to emphasize this important related point that person centered care moves health care from the principle of primacy of patient welfare to the principle of moral equality of people. The principle of moral equality, the principle of equal consideration of equal interests. It actually comes from vegetarianism. That's where I discovered it, and I really believe in it. Put simply, person-centered care brings the clinician, not merely the patient, into the light. I want you to imagine briefly that you're standing in your living room at night and inside it's dark. You're standing in the dark and outside in the courtyard it's light. And if you look through the window, you can see the other, can't you? You can see through the window what's on the other side. And if the light were on inside but dark outside, if you looked in the window, what would you see? You'd see your reflection. But if the light were of equal intensity on both sides of the window pane, what you actually get is a window mirror effect. You can see through the window, but you can also see yourself. You can see that I'm using light and it as a synonym for care. So in the window mirror, one can see, consider, care for, and balance the equal moral interests of ourselves and the other. Let me emphasize here that I'm not trying to take the spotlight away from the patient. The patient's incredibly important. What I'm trying to do is to bring the clinician out of the dark to join the patient in the light. And I think that's good for everybody. And I'll talk a lot more about this in my second presentation. I've been doing some more kind of, you know, thinking about these deep issues which I find fascinating. And I think Two, that the window mirror also exposes what we see in the external world as simply an appearance. You know, the, the beautiful purple of your top is simply an appearance in my mind. It's not really purple, you know, the light. We, can't, we won't go into the physics, but it's an appearance in my mind. And that appearance is likewise the persona. It's not the real us, it's the persona behind which dwells the person. Within the person, consciousness of the equal interests of inner and outer selves can begin to balance. The fourth principle I've called bridging. When particular moral interests compete, interests of the patient, perhaps interests of the clinician, they compete, elucidating and balancing or prioritizing them requires dialogic participation in multi-relational social networks. I think connectedness is so important. This participation is conducive to the bridging of people's interests for mutual safety and ideally to construct win-win solutions. These solutions go beyond the goal of self-efficacy and health maximization in order to meet needs for self-esteem and self-transcendence. That is, they aim to go beyond the self and previous limits in order to achieve physical, social, psychological, and spiritual progress. Almost finished. I know I'm over time. I apologize for that. Lastly, I want to suggest that person-centered care takes a basic attitude that values and humanizes science. This attitude aligns the scientific method and metaphysical outlook for a purposeful life. Here I am constructing scientific humanism as naturalistic in an inclusive sense. It can be defined in many different ways. I'm defining it in an inclusive sense that does not exclude the supernatural or depend upon it. For me, however, scientific humanism is non-speciesist in seeing human beings at the center not of worldly importance, but of control over human decisions and actions. Um, the reason I made that rather odd sounding point is, um, you know, must one be a human being to be a person? Um, I, I was watching videos on the plane and one was about a man who fell in love with his operating system. Was she a person? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, my last slide, my last slide. 
So in conclusion, what I've tried to do here is to summarise, I hope helpfully for you, some for me, for me at least, I hope for you, some of the key differences or distinctions between patient-centred care and person-centred care. So for me, person-centred care focuses explicitly on respect for the person rather than on patient care. Personalism underpins person-centred care, as does virtue ethics and the principle of moral equality. Person-centred care emphasises caring as joyful and humanising scientific practice. Such caring should bridge moral interests in order to realise outcomes that include self-transcendence. And um, I suspect that we have little time for questions, but again, I uh, couldn't resist putting this wonderful photograph in because it's almost morning tea. And um, so just sort of a little, little, little reminder that it's almost morning tea before. And I know we've got a panel discussion. Um, so that's my lot. Thank you. Thank you.